First, I want to welcome both you gentlemen to the Non Sequitur Show. I'll be reading both of you your bios as given to us, and then we'll jump right into you just talking about yourself and your presentation. So first, we have Dr. Jeanson. Dr. Nathaniel T. Jeanson earned his Bachelor's of Science in Molecular Biology and Bioinformatics from University of Wisconsin Parkside, and his PhD in Cell and Environmental Biology from Harvard University. His research findings have been presented at regional and national conferences and have been peer published in peer-reviewed journals such as Blood, Nature, and Cell. Since 2009, he has been actively researching the origin of species, both at the Institute of Creation Research and at Answers in Genesis. We also have Dr. Mays with us. Dr. Herman Mays has a Bachelor's of Science degree from University of Kentucky in biology with a minor in anthropology and a PhD in biology also from the University of Kentucky. His thesis was on genetic mating system and reproductive behavior of yellow-breasted chat. Herman went on to two National Science Foundation postdoctoral positions at Auburn University, studying behavior and disease ecology, an assistant professor position in biology department at Southern Georgia Southern University, and a seven-year stint as the curator of zoology at the Cincinnati Museum Center, where he was in charge of a collection of over a quarter of a million specimens and built a research program in molecular population genetics and systematics. In 2014, Herman has been assistant professor of genetics at Marshall University's in University in Huntington, West Virginia. Herman has an international collaborative research program involving molecular genetics and genomics to answer basic questions in evolutionary biology. He has participated in field work on three continents and the Isle of Hawaii, Hawaii including extensive experience studying the birds of East Asia. Herman and his collaborators have published nearly 30 papers in peer-reviewed literature in behavioral ecology, molecular evolution, phylogeography, population genetics, systematics, and genomics, including several studies of molecular systematics of the birds of Asia and the Philippines and the first ever draft genome sequence for the Sumatran rhinoceros. These published works have been cited over 1,200 times over the past 15 years. Herman is also a science educator with a longtime interest in the discussion over creationism versus evolution. Okay, and I believe that uh, prior to the show, we all agreed that Dr. Jensen would be starting. Uh, these two rounds are going to be each 25 minutes to uh, introduce themselves and, and make stake their case. Um, after that, we will go to a open discussion format for the remainder uh, of the show. And uh, we will be switching screens here in just a second, so you'll see the presentation mode and the time at the bottom. Uh, we will let you guys know when you have a minute left, so don't mind uh, that, that interruption. And um, Dr. Jensen, whenever you're ready, sir, the floor is yours. I want to start just by uh, saying uh, several words of, of thanks. I appreciated the prequel, I guess you could say, to this debate last night with John Perry and Shannon Q. Uh, John Perry bent over backwards to try to make it fair. He obviously doesn't agree with me, but uh, the fact that I think he got flack from those who would be his allies shows just how much he tried to be fair, and, and, and I really appreciate that. So uh, thanks to him. And Shannon also asked that we'd, we'd focus on the arguments, not, a, not on straw men, and recommend people engage the work. And so this is a real privilege to be able to be on the show and to have it set up that way. It's, uh, I've written, obviously, a complex book, Replacing Darwin, and for them to help bring the audience up to speed is a is very helpful, and I'm hoping that we can take it slow. Uh, one of the main things I took away from last night's was we might not be able to, we probably won't be able to complete an analysis of the book in one evening. Uh, it, it's, it covers so much territory, and my hope is we'll be able to engage that even if no one changes their mind by the end of this evening, they'll walk away saying, okay, I understand better why each person holds to what they do. So uh, a big thanks to, to those two last night, also to, to Steve and Kyle for having me on and to Dr. Mays especially. I appreciate him being so willing to uh, engage what I published and, and give some critical feedback. So thank you very much. What I want to do in, in my presentation is really just give an overview to try to set the context for an ongoing discussion uh, and in a sense hopefully tee it up for Dr. Mays and establish some common ground here. What I uh, want to do if you'll go to the next slide, actually go to the third slide, look at the overview of what I want to accomplish here is just give some background to who I'm targeting with the book, with the type of audience, the level of technicality I, I strove for, uh, 
I want to then go into some of the historical background to tonight's debate because I think it's very important to understand what's come before. And I think what comes before shows how what we're discussing today uh, is relevant and why it's probably different from what most people have heard. It's a very different debate we're having tonight than what, we, what, what would have happened 40 years ago. And then I just want to sketch very quickly sort of the big picture points that my book makes without trying to, to justify them just so people can get a sense for where I'm going with my arguments and, and we'll probably get into the weeds eventually uh, and might have to take several of these debates to, to go through all these points, but uh, just so people have a, a sense for what I'm going for with the book. Next slide. Start with that, next slide. So my target uh, writers say you, you gotta pick one audience, tape it to your screen and, and focus on that. And really I'd say it was students. I tried to broaden it to anyone uh, those who have no background in genetics to those who are very deep in it. I had a pastor read through it, a draft of this to say, hey, look, I want people who've got no background, no training in science to be able to understand this. So he gave me feedback. He's the one who said, give me, you know, include a glossary, define your terms, these sorts of things. But uh, what this book represents, uh, set it set next to what my organization does, Answers in Genesis, uh, is somewhat unique. Answers in Genesis largely targets church audiences for those who'd say, yes, I believe the Bible is true. Uh, help me connect the scientific dots. This book I've written explicitly for those who say, I don't agree with you, so give me your best shot. And that's the type of argument I try to make, 10 chapters of science, and very little on religion, theology, philosophy, that sort of thing. So the two words I keep in mind that I've kept in mind to try to summarize what I'm trying to accomplish in this book is to make it accessible for, again, anyone to follow, and defensible. So it's not designed to be a polemic where I engage every counter argument, I feel like that would bog down the text. I've put most of that into the end notes where you get the a lot of the nitty gritty details. I tried to get a flowing narrative so you get the sense for what I'm saying. And then the uh, the, the points of disagreement or the, the details, you'll find a lot of that in the, in the technical end notes. Next slide. So the scope uh, and the focus and limitations of the book are biology and specifically the origin of species. I'm, I'm writing this really trying to just narrate the history since Darwin, what's happened and why do I think what's happened should lead us to a different view. Again, it's not written to say, here's what so-and-so said and here's why he's wrong or she's wrong, but let's just walk through what's happened in the fields of science, especially in biology since then. Because my training is biology and in genetics, I focus very little on geology, astronomy. I will do very little to defend those fields because that's not my professional training. All I can give you is a layperson's perspective and Here's what so-and-so has told me. And so I touch it very little in the book and basically shove it to technical references in the endnotes. And you can see as well, basically the only time I touch religion and philosophy is uh, in the afterward. Next slide. So my main thesis, and, and we'll go through the outline a little bit later in more detail, is that there's been three historical events that have come together that I think should cause us to, come, uh, to should lead us to a different explanation of the origin of species. And I picked the title very specifically, uh, Replacing Darwin. What I do in the book is not deal with 1859 science per se. I try to deal uh, with 1859 as it's appropriate historically, but uh, evolution in its current form, Darwin is, is, is a brand name. So you've got to put something in the title that catches people's attention. And I, I called it Replacing Darwin, not Rebutting Darwin, for reasons I'll get into and hopefully it'll be obvious from the history I give. Uh, and I put it in present tense because uh, it's, it's a science book. It's not a, it's not a polemic of here's what's happened. Science is always changing. This is an ongoing process. And that's what I wanted to communicate with the book. Next slide. Question of peer review always comes up. I had several creationist PhDs peer review it, but my goal in this and my goal continually has been to get critical feedback. Science advances. This is a, one of the hardest lessons I'd learn in graduate school. Science advances when your hardest critics look at your work. Uh, and to me, the best scientists are those who learn to view their work the most critically. Uh, it's nothing I learned as an undergraduate. So learning to stick your neck out is a hard lesson. And so I've sent the book next slide uh, to Jerry Coyne. He was I actually personally corresponded with him. He politely declined to review it. Next slide. PZ Myers has been sent a copy. I uh, asked him by email and he never responded. Next slide. Richard Dawkins was sent a copy of the book. I was actually in the UK doing a book tour this past June. He was personally invited by one of the students at Oxford to come out to the talk, but declined. So next slide. 
that's some of the peer review we've sought. Next slide. We do publish, so this we have a peer reviewed journal on the Answers in Genesis website. We publish critical reviews. And one of these that has come up since the book came out was by Stefan Frello. He's a PhD botanist in Denmark. Uh, he has his own website. You can contact him with his experience to find out how it was. I think he'd say it was overall positive. The only things I think that were changed in his review, despite it being critical, were some just grammatical things because English is not his first language. So to try to make it clear what he's saying. Next slide. You can find my, uh, my response to that as well. Next slide. He's written a response to that. And so I'm working on my response to his response to my response to his response to my book or whatever number we're on now. And we'll see how long it takes. So I'm formally inviting anyone who has a, a critical view of the book or wants to engage the science. And here's, here's what I think uh, the book goes awry. Submit a critique. We publish them. Uh, I look forward to it. This is how my goal is to see the science advance. Next slide. And just jump to uh, 17 there, so slide 17. And tonight, hopefully, will also be the start of an, an, an ongoing review process. And I'm very grateful for Dr. Mays for being willing to, to go through the book and, and give his critical feedback. Next slide. So that hopefully gives you a sense for some of the big picture on what I was trying to accomplish and what I was not trying to accomplish with this book. Next slide. Uh, Next slide. So what I want to do now is, is, is go back to the 1700s and narrate very quickly, actually even before that, uh, narrate very quickly where this debate has come from and hopefully you can see where it's going and, and why I've taken the approach that I've done and uh, why Dr. Mays and I will be talking about certain things I'll be talking about tonight. So to go all the way back to the Greeks and, and to trace science and the study of nature up to the time of about the Renaissance and Descartes, uh, if you study that, you'll realize that the way we do science today is very different from how it was done for about 2,000 years. If you can believe it, science for, from the Greeks till then was basically done by thinking. Next slide. Or you, the, the technical term would be deductive reasoning. Next slide. So to, to use a very simple illustration, uh, deductive reasoning, the, the science by thinking would start with the premise. All animals, let's say, must camouflage their appearance. Let's say that's the premise. Next slide. You might then observe that uh, zebras have an appearance that's black and white stripes. Next slide. And so then using the rules of logic and deductive reasoning, you could conclude, therefore, black and white stripes and zebra serve as camouflage. Next slide. If you're doing science like the Greeks and you run into the peacock, you immediately run into a problem. This guy's obviously not displaying his feathers for the purpose of hiding the bushes, but for attracting attention to find a mate. Next slide. So the point of this simple example is that this whole method rises and falls on the validity of the premises. And if your premise is wrong, which it appears to be in this case, then how can you know that your conclusion is correct? Next slide. And then go one further to the zebra. So if you look at the literature today, the scientific literature, and what, what is the explanation for the zebra stripes? What is their function? Next slide. You actually find four competing hypotheses and continuing disagreement. Deductive reasoning doesn't give you the answer. Next slide. And to use a more take-home example, I, I guess, uh, personal example, how is deductive reasoning going to help you solve the question of cancer? Next slide. How would you think your way to a solution? We know what we want the answer to be, that some drug, some treatment, some exercise, something cures colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, you, you name it. Next slide. We know what we want the sentence right before that to be. We want it, cancer occurs in some tissue. And then next slide. What premise, though, will allow us to deduce this conclusion? So if we're living in the era of the Greeks, to the Renaissance, we're stuck. There's nothing that deductive reasoning can give us in terms of an answer. Next slide. Fortunately, that's not where we stayed around the time of uh, Descartes. Next slide. A man named Francis Bacon came along, contemporary of Descartes, and gives us the method of inductive reasoning or science by experimentation. Next slide. So this works sort of the opposite way. It starts with observations, a very simple observation. You use zebras again. Next slide. Uh, you, Everyone of the kindergartners will observe zebras have black and white stripes, four legs. Next slide. And if you make this observation over and over again, next slide, eventually you might infer a general principle. Since you have not used formal logical proofs to reach this conclusion, you cannot use the term proof. We don't use the term proof in science. Medical doctors tend to, but researchers don't use the term proof because we're not using science by thinking. We're using science by experimentation. This is a statement of probability. Next slide. And to evaluate the probability, the frequency with which this occurs, and how often it's true, you have to use experimental testing. 
Next slide. So you might go to Africa and, and just start recording how many times you see zebras with four legs, black and white stripes. Next slide. Eventually, you might find some exceptions, and these will force you to go back and revisit the inference you've made. Next slide. Use, again, this a, a health example. This method, science-based experimentation, is the way, the only way we have, basically, to get an answer to cancer. We begin with observations. Here's one that's been made frequently, the one that drove my interest in graduate school. So cancers have specific DNA mutations, and there's reams and reams of papers coming out documenting this. Next slide. This has been made over and over again, so much so that we basically have a general rule. You could generalize that perhaps all cancers are caused by specific DNA mutations. And if you take that the step further and say, well, maybe we can cure cancer by targeting these specific DNA mutations. Next slide. Uh, advanced two, actually. This is, this is a, a way forward, but it's not a formal proof. The way you evaluate this is by testing. Next slide. And actually go to uh, slide 48 there. One of the rare success stories we've had using this approach is in a form of blood cancer, a, a, a leukemia, so an overproliferation of white blood cells. And chronic myelogenous leukemia, one form of it, next slide, has specific DNA changes. The details here really don't matter, but the point is they have specific mutations that occur. Next slide, and Gleevec targets one of these mutations. And we've seen a fair amount of success with this, thankfully, and hopefully this type of process will lead us to more cures. Next slide. There's one other element in this process of, the process of science by experimentation that we need to add. Next slide. And it comes after Francis Bacon, actually from last century, a man named Karl Popper gives us this idea of falsifiability. Next slide. So what's falsifiability? It's a really counterintuitive way of thinking that I think may, many lay people still don't realize. It took me a long time to, to grasp this. So his idea basically says that science is characterized by being able to prove that something is wrong. Next slide. So in a nutshell, the inductive method of reasoning starts with observation. You make enough observations that leads you to a general rule. And then what you try to do is not prove that your rule is true. You try to disprove it. And if that rule stands after years and years and years of attempts at experimentally disprove it, you elevate it to theory, to law, and so forth. So we never talk about certainty or proof in science. We're talking about levels of confidence and this sort of thing because of the nature of how science works. So let's now apply this next slide to this to the to the origins debate to see it, how it's worked its way through historically. And I'm going to start with Linnaeus in 1859 because Linnaeus gives us this idea of species. We're talking about the origin of species. We're basically using a Linnaean term. And he early in his career contemporaries saw creatures like this Arctic fox. Next slide. Uh, creatures like the red fox. They're Coats seem to match their environments. Next slide, and this is just one very simple example, but everywhere you go around the globe, it seems like the traits of species match their environments. Next slide. So that if you look at where they live, and actually go to slide 60, since I'm running short on, on time here, the natural inference using things like William Paley's watchmaker analogy, uh, if you go to slide 60, the map there, slowing down, anyway. I'll just talk through it. Seems to have frozen my screen. Linnaeus and his contemporaries thought that God created the Arctic fox for the Arctic, the red fox for Eurasia. They were put there for a purpose. Go to slide 64, it should be the Darwin slide. This is the idea that Darwin tries to refute then in 1859. This is to go to slide 66. This is the map I was trying to have earlier. Where, uh, should have a big red X through it. This is the idea Darwin's trying to disprove, and he does so very effectively. Darwin disproves that God creates species in their current locations, that they have not migrated, that they have no common ancestry. He is using the inductive method basically to, to accomplish this. Uh, next slide. What many people don't realize, and I was sort of shocked to read this, to learn this as I read The Origin of Species, uh, Darwin was challenging a scientific consensus. People held to, even though by that time, many had embraced uh, millions of years age for the earth, they were still thinking in species fixity terms. And so Darwin preemptively addressed his critics' objections, saying, why maybe ask if all the most eminent living naturalists and geologists rejected this view, his view of the mutability or change of species. So Darwin says, I know you're going to say, why does no one agree with you? And then he gives four reasons why he thinks it's time to challenge the consensus. Next slide. If you look 10 years later at the fifth edition, that sentence changes. By that time, he's won the scientific community to his side. He's, he's changed the consensus. Next slide. So now I want uh, to set out a timeline very quickly of what happens next. So that consensus, next slide, that he establishes in, in 1869 lasts to the present day. Next slide. 
In the lay community, though, there's obviously been severe disagreement, perhaps most famously illustrated by the Scopes trial. Next slide. A uh, significant event is the centennial celebration in, in 1959, uh, where there's renewed interest in the study of evolution and evolutionary research, perhaps indirectly, ironically, next slide, around the same time, two years later, 1961, is the beginning of the modern revival of the Young Earth Creationist movement. Henry Morris, a PhD hydrologist, publishes a book, The Genesis Flood, uh, that I think evolutionary creationists agree is, is the catalyst for people like me in our positions today. He wrote a book earlier than that, though he was on staff, chair of the engineering department at Virginia Tech, next slide. And he was, a, so he's a Christian and he had Christian students coming to him asking about science in the Bible. And he, he wrote a book that you might believe in 1946. He said, even at that point, it's well to observe the Bible does not teach the fixity of species. Next slide. He, he's rejecting this idea of this, this fixity of species. And that's probable the original Genesis kind is closely akin to what the modern systematist calls a family. I don't have time to go through all this. It's basically the fact that species could interbreed. What I want to show you though, is go to slide 79 with Linnaeus. This view actually goes back to Linnaeus himself. What many people don't know is that Linnaeus started as a species fixity proponent, but ended his career uh, saying this, that God created as many individuals as there were orders. God later mixed these to form genera. Next slide. Nature in turn mixed these genera to form species. And fate makes these baguette varieties. So go to slide 82 with the foxes. So the red fox, the arctic fox, not only are separate species, they belong to separate genera. Next slide. So if Linnaeus is saying that nature can mix genera, then the, the created unit must not be species, it must not be genus. Next slide, actually go to slide 85. It's, it must be above that. So even as early as the 1700s, Linnaeus is espousing this view. Uh, Darwin was not aware of this. I think it was Lyell who made him aware of it later in life that, that Linnaeus had changed his view. So now go to slide 87. I wanna, I wanna focus here on the, from 60s to 1980, there's significant events that set the context for what we're discussing tonight. So after 1961, the next thing that happens, next slide, there's enough interest in the Christian community and Morris's work that there's enough PhD scientists who, or I guess, rallied to his cause. You form, the Professional Society, Creation Research Society is formed. Next slide. Uh, eventually, life becomes difficult for Morris at Virginia Tech, so he founds in 1970 the Institute for Creation Research, which is where I worked for six years before coming to Answers in Genesis. Next slide. Uh, Dwayne Gish is one of the early allies of Morris, PhD biochemist, and during the 1970s, they do about 100 debates with thousands of students coming out university campuses, some of them writing up in a very positive way. And, and my goal here is just to report this fairly. I think it's the evolutionists themselves who would say they were very unprepared for this, and that's not a criticism. That's just, I, I think what's happening is you have so little organized professional creationist opposition to evolution prior to 1961, and, and I've seen this just looking in the textbooks from the 1950s, evolutionary textbooks from the 1950s, have very little in the way of dealing with creation science because I think there's there's very little national creation science to speak of. And so this comes along, it's something new. Uh, it's basically ignored by the professional scientific community. Once they do enough debates, Morris and Gish, and uh, there's legislation introduced. This 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 is a groundswell. Next slide that, that begins to capture the evolutionist attention. I want to focus on what Morris and Gish were doing because I think the reaction to this sets the context for today. So Morris's own words and what they tried to do in, in debates, he said they would make four points. Number one, they would show that the, they'd say that the fossil record uh, shows that macroevolution has not occurred in the past. Point two, mutation selection shows it's not occurring in the present. Next slide. Point three, Morris is famous for this. Laws of thermodynamics show that evolution cannot occur at all. And, and Gish famous for saying probability shows original life can't happen. So if you've, whatever side you're on, you've probably heard these things discussed at length. Uh, especially at the lay level. Uh, next slide. So by the end of the 70s, I think there's enough national interest. There's legislation that's happening. It, it, it catches, I think, the attention of the evolutionary community in 1981. Next slide. The National Center for Science Education is founded. Eugenie Scott, one of the more famous past presidents. Next slide. You have a, a watershed trial in 1982 in Arkansas law mandate, mandating the teaching of creation science is challenged in federal court and overturned. Next slide. And this is a watershed for the following reason. If you, if you look at the number of anti-creationist publications prior to that, you see very little, around about 1980. After that, you see a whole number of them. So now evolutionary textbooks have whole chapters dedicated to dealing with creation science arguments. Next slide. So what I want you to see is the reaction to Morrison Gish is, is very specific. So I'll just use a few examples. We could go through many more. Niles Eldridge wrote a book in 1982, The Monkey Business. 
He's famous, of course, along with Stephen Jay Gould for punctuated equilibrium. He says, creation science isn't science at all, nor have creation scientists managed to come up with even a single intellectually compelling, scientifically testable statement about the natural world. Next slide. He says, at least 95% of their reams of privately published books and pamphlets are devoted to an attack on conventional science. And that's what you'll see in the Morrison Gish strategy. Those four points are basically anti-evolutionary points. And, and Eldridge's uh, reaction to that is to say, that's not enough. If you want to place it in the scientific table, you need to give us a testable, falsifiable idea. Next slide. He says, creation scientists pose no testable hypotheses, make no predictions, observations worthy of the name. If you look at the court decision, next slide itself, what the judge said for why this doesn't belong in the science classroom, he lists several characteristics of science. Just for sake of time, I'm focusing on the fifth one. He says, science is falsifiable. Next slide. He says, creation science fails to meet these essential characteristics. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead just for sake of time to slide 106, Karl Popper. I could... You, you could go look at the debates even this last year with Dr. Mays and with uh, Aaron Ra. I encourage you to watch those. This, this has been the concept and a very good challenge to creationists. Give us a falsifiable prediction. This, is the, this, this flows right out of the nature of science. And what I try to go through in my book in detailing the history of genetics is this is exactly how we know that DNA is the substance of heredity. Because these ideas, scientific ideas, make falsifiable predictions. And in, in the past century, we were able to disprove proteins as the substance of heredity. And at 107, this is really the bottom line, as far as I'm concerned, what it, the significance of what we're doing tonight. What, what I didn't and tried to do in the book that came out last year, a book replacing Darwin, was to give testable, falsifiable predictions. That's to me that why this is not the 1970s Morris Gish debate. We're dealing now with a full-fledged creation biology explanation. And let me just run through very quickly, next slide, some of the predictions I've put in this book. Uh, predictions on the rates of speciation, go to slide 110. We'll probably spend some time on this tonight. Predictions on the rate of which mitochondrial DNA mutates. Uh, we probably won't have time for nuclear DNA function. Next slide, uh, a very complex prediction on the relationship between nuclear heterozygosity and mitochondrial mutation rates. We can probably discuss that in a different section. I hope we'll get to this tonight. Next slide, uh, looking at the signature of recent historical events, the history of civilization within our DNA. Anyway, there's a number of predictions, falsifiable predictions that are in this book. Next slide. That's the context that I took for granted. I'm born 1980, and so this idea of falsifiable predictions is the, is the environment, the milieu in which I grew up, and is just second nature to me, though I've realized many people, though, uh, have grown up in a different historical context and are, and, are, and are still thinking, I guess, in 1970s terms. Now, let me just give you a really brief outline, go to slide 116 of, of the basic parts of my book. So I put, there's 10 chapters, there's three parts. Each part is making one basic point, making one basic claim. The first part makes a very simple claim that uh, Darwin took a scientific risk. That's what I'm claiming. He tried to, in, in a nutshell, he tried to answer a fundamentally genetic question long before we had the genetic tools with which to answer it. So you can see the history of genetics there. Point number two, next slide is going through the non-genetic evidence. And one of my basic points is, and hopefully you'll be able to see some of this illustrated just in the past few minutes, creation science has changed significantly. And that changes some of the significance of Darwin's original points, because he's arguing against a view of the origin of species that modern young earth creationists don't hold to. Uh, next slide. And really the reason I'm, I'm saying it's time to actually go to the next slide, to replace Darwin, is born out of this idea of, of the nature of science. I'm saying it's time to replace Darwin. I'm claiming that in my view I'm proposing makes testable retrodictions and predictions that are successful. There's falsifiable ideas there. If you go to slide 120, this is really, I think, uh, where I'm hoping we can have the debate. Since we're talking about falsifiable predictions, it's the future where this debate really uh, should be. I've said, here's what's, what we should find out. So what has happened since October? Have my predictions been borne out or have they been falsified? And we can have this debate again in a year and revisit these very same questions. How have these predictions been borne out? Uh, and for sake of time, let me just go to slide 129. You can get this book uh, on Amazon. I don't get any proceeds from it, so this is not a sales pitch for me. Kindle and print versions go to slide 131. I've set up a Facebook page for the purpose of dialogue. <coughs> it's not for trolling. There are other pages for trolling. This I set up just to have a safe space, so to speak, for people to say, hey, I've got a problem with this, or what did you mean by that? Uh, my goal in this debate is not hoorah and uh, bash people, but I'd like to see the science advance. So thank you very much. And I should say my, my goal here was to try to 
present the history as fairly as possible. So I'm happy to have Dr. Mays correct uh, anything that he thought I, I misstated. I was trying to draw on what Fudiyama has written and others, uh, just so people understand. I, one thing I, I realized in giving presentation to creationist audiences was many of them did not know this history that I took for granted. And so I'll give talks here at the museum and I'll spend 50 minutes giving history and then 10 minutes at the end saying, here's what's in the book so that, okay, this is why it matters. Anyway. Well, the first, the first correction is his name is Fatuma. Fatuma, thank you. We ready for me? I was muted. I apologize. Um, yes, Dr. Mace, the uh, the floor is now yours, sir. You want to put up my slides? I probably won't be flick flicking yeah, through the slides until about five minutes. So just bear with me. <sighs> okay, so I'm just going to dive right into it. Nathaniel Jensen's replacing Darwin could be called a pseudo scientific work, but arguably that is unfair. Pseudo comes from the Greek pseudis for false or pseudos for falsehood. This to me suggests that a willing participation in a deliberate lie. And I'm happy to, to grant Nathaniel some sincerity. Because the bulk of the errors in replacing Darwin are errors of omission, I lean towards describing it as quasi-scientific. It's partially or ostensibly science. Quasi is Latin for as if, and it's indeed as if what you're reading in replacing Darwin is science. Now, I'm willing to be generous and accept that the majority of these omissions are simply due to an author with no actual expertise in the field he's writing about. The subject of finding Darwin is rooted in population genetics, biogeography, phylogeography, speciation, molecular evolution, systematics, none of which are fields where Jensen possesses any professional expertise himself. Nor am I aware of Jensen ever having someone with actual expertise in these fields reviewing either his book or any of his articles published on the Answers in Genesis website. As far as I know, he's only had his fellow like-minded creationists chime in on his work, or at best, someone with some molecular biology background who he's described in other talks as a friend and theistic evolutionist. Isaac Newton famously said, if he's seen any further, it's because he stands on the shoulders of giants, meaning in science, we build from the findings of others. The entire book has the feel of someone who's abandoned Newton's maxim and replaced it with, I'll make it up as I go along. Steven Pinker in his book, Better Angels of Our Nature said, no one is smart enough to figure out anything worthwhile from scratch. Yet that seems to be exactly what Nathaniel's attempting to do. However, Jensen has enough biology background to give his arguments the appearance of being grounded in science. The audience of his book are predominantly like-minded creationists with little or no scientific background themselves. And to them, a Harvard degree in biology seems all that's necessary to provide credibility in any field of the life sciences or the sciences in general. Answers in Genesis plays upon this and hires people like Georgia Purdom or Nathaniel Jensen and touts them as legitimate scientists with ongoing research programs. The reality is here they have a legitimate scientific background that they are leveraging in an attempt to lend scientific credibility to what is ultimately an ideological and religious agenda. Answers in Genesis by its own admission is a religious ministry that requires its employees from Jensen to Purdom to someone working at the register at the gift shop to adhere to particular fundamentalist interpretations of the Bible and a number of specific positions on social culture war issues. It's not a museum. It's not a research institution. It's not promoting science. It's a religious ministry, and that's fine. Replacing Darwin is quasi-science. It's ostensibly scientific, presenting arguments constructed carefully around glaring omissions and mostly divorced from the actual primary literature in the fields it seeks to replace. It's as if it were science and an audience with shared religious and ideological leanings and little knowledge of biology are simply incapable of escaping their own tribal preferences and thus can't view it critically. The danger with works like Replacing Darwin is that people either deliberately ignore or are unaware of its omissions and become enamored with the Harvard credentials of its author, such that they legitimize narrow fundamentalist religious views in science. Appeals to belief in divine agency are not scientific propositions. That's not to say that people should be devoid of such appeals. If the discussion is about whether or not people should be free to exercise their religious convictions, and whether those religious convictions themselves are legitimate, 
as personal theological beliefs, then I suspect I'm on Nathaniel's side of that discussion. I'm not out as a scientist or a science educator to rob anyone of their religious beliefs. My goal is simply to teach science literacy and an appreciation for the natural world and scientific method. I'm not interested in converting people to atheism, and I'm not an atheist myself. However, religious beliefs are not science, and presenting them as such does both science and religion a great disservice. Now, let's look at some of the claims that um, Nathaniel made in his book here. One of the key claims he makes, and he kind of mentions this, is that creationism makes testable predictions, and those predictions we can measure against the evidence. And that's, to some degree, true. So if you confine the predictions of creationism to something like independent origins of different groups of organisms, such that they never shared a common ancestry with any other organisms, that bare claim by itself is something that we can test. Now, Nathaniel said that we have to wait a year or more for this claim to be tested. We don't. It's been tested explicitly for the past 30 years. So let's think about this idea of common ancestry versus common design. So common ancestry says different species share a common genetic history, while common design says different species appeared independently and never shared a common genetic ancestor. So next slide. So you can talk about, uh, oh, the next, yeah, thanks. Universal common ancestry. You can talk about the common ancestry of specific groups, like primates, for instance, or fish on the other end. Um, both may be tested by the same approaches. Next. So does any single phylogenetic tree support common ancestry? No. Single phylogenetic trees aren't tests of common ancestry per se. We support common ancestry across multiple independent lines of evidence. And there's compelling both informal verbal arguments for common ancestry um, based on these lines of evidence. But are there explicit statistical tests of common ancestry, the common ancestry hypothesis? Yes, there are. So next slide. Now, we can produce gene trees. So gene trees are trees that we make that describe the genealogical relationships between gene sequences. And the goal is in, in systematics is to take those gene trees or those trees we produce from other data as well, and uh, use those to test hypotheses about a species tree. Now, different genes can have different independent histories. So no one gene tree is, is necessarily reliable in, in, in delimiting a species history. Creationism, however, however, says there's no species trees at all, at least not among the created kinds. So within these family groups that uh, Nathaniel says are the created kinds, um, among those groups or between those groups, he says there's no common ancestry. So there should be no trees that we can resolve. So what does the common ancestry model predict for comparison among gene trees? Now, the key here is we're looking for um, gene trees that are based on neutral variation. That is, the variation in the genes that we're looking at is variation that doesn't necessarily affect the function of that gene. And often we look at genes that aren't necessarily having any function at all. So all the variation would be neutral. All we mean by neutral variation is all the variants in the population have an equal fitness. No one should predominate over the other. When that happens, their evolution is governed by drift. And we understand those principles pretty well from population genetics. So next slide. So one example we can give, and John was very good to talk about this last night. Um, about encoding genes. So you can look at some coding genes. And so th these are genes that biochemically encode for protein. So they get transcribed into RNA and that RNA gets translated into amino acid chains, which fold up to become the proteins. Well, there's a what we call a fourfold degenerate nature to that code. So every three letters of DNA encodes for one amino acid, but the last letter can vary quite a bit and it produces the same amino acid. Now there are codon biases and there's, there's reasons why some organisms prefer some codons over others. But within that, we still know 
because we've tested this, despite the fact that there's codon biases, that there is neutral variation. And not just in coding genes, but we can look in introns and other types of gene sequences as well. So what happens when we look at that? Next slide. So this is a paper by uh, Martin uh, Bontrager and uh, others from uh, David Baum's lab, um, looking at statistical evidence for a common ancestry, specifically among primates. So they created these independent data sets from 17 protein coding genes. And what they did was they have 16 primate families and they randomly took a species from each of the 16 families and made a, a different data set. So they did this 50 times. So they had 50 independent replicates of this data set. And what they ended up with for each, for each of the 50 uh, data sets, they had 3,657 aligned codons. So next slide. So here's one measure of what they did. So you can have, um, so for instance, if you have 16 families and say at all those families in this gene, um, there's a site there that, produce, that is uh, valine, which is an, a one amino acid. Well, what you do is you take all the possible codons that can encode for valine and you select from them randomly, right? So any codon that can select that you can uh, choose from to produce valine, you select from, uh, you choose either at, with equal probability or you can choose them with some, according to some model of codon bias. So you can incorporate that in your test. And what they did was create these data sets where you have a distribution of, of trees that you produce from those, those simulated data sets, that would be the trees that you would predict you would see if the different families never shared a common ancestor. So in each of these graphs at the top, um, it, and the, the, there's one graph at the top, one in the middle, one in, at the bottom, those are referring to three different types of models. So they didn't want to just test according to one type of codon bias. They tested for three. On the, the black bars on the, on the um, right of the graph represent the distribution of uh, codons that you would predict. So again, this is like Nathaniel said, we're we're having a prediction that's based on this central feature of creationism, that these families never shared a common ancestor. So that's the prediction that you would have if those 16 families never shared a common ancestor. That's the black bars. The gray bars on the other side are the actual distributions of codons. So that's the actual distributions of codons in these things. And it's tested across either all codons, which is on the left, or only you can test it only for the codons that are variable. So that are that are variable uh, uh, between uh, the different species in the trees. And then the three levels of this is you do this for different types of biases in the codons. Each time you do it, no matter how you tweak the analysis, the differences between the expectation of creationism and the reality of the real data that you look at are huge. So they are hundreds, in some cases, 200 or th almost 300 standard deviations away from one another. If you know anything about statistics, this, there's a p-value associated with this. This is an infinitesimally small p-value. Now they took the same data and they tested it other ways. Next slide. So they asked, how similar are two phylogenetic trees based on one on amino acids? So you could build a tree based on amino acids and other one you based on nucleotides on the DNA based on these synonymous or these silent neutral sites. Without common ancestry, there's no reason to expect these two trees would be the same. Okay, so that's another prediction of creationism that has been tested. The p-values for the differences between the trees, the predicted trees that you would get under creationism and the real trees that you get in the actual data are tiny. So across all 50 replicates, the p-values range from about 3 times 10 to the minus 9th to 1 times 10 to the minus 13th. So that's if you think of that in terms of an odds ratio, that's like a 1 in 40 billion chance of getting a match that's um, 
that's actually that's a mistype of that's a match that's that that bad or worse between the two trees. Okay, so a very small p value. Um, then you can look at another test. They did the length of the tree. So the tree length, uh, there's there's different expectations for the tree length um, under a creationist model versus a the actual data. And you can see again the black. Oh, next slide. Sorry. You can see the black bars there are the predicted uh, predictions of the creationist model and the gray bars of the actual data. And you can see they don't overlap. There are 100 standard deviations apart from one another. So Bontrager in this paper has falsified the predictions, a central prediction of almost any creationist model that these different families don't share a common ancestor. Now, is that the only paper that's done this? It's just, just a, a fluke waiting for other papers. No, next slide. Creationist um, predictions have been tested explicitly using molecular data for since the early 1980s. Um, so we've had these very explicit tests using uh, very sophisticated types of data um, for a very long time. So for instance, Theobald in 2010 tested for universal common ancestry, not common ancestry among primates, but among eukaryotes, um, bacteria, and archaea, and tested by a, a model selection method that doesn't necessarily rely on sequence similarity, and that supported common ancestry. White in 2013 tested a common ancestry. It said common ancestry explains the available data in protein sequences from both chloroplasts, nuclear and mitochondrial sequences across eight data sets and 51 different proteins, also supporting the common ancestry model and rejecting any model that's based on independent histories, which is what a creation model would be based on. Baum in 2016 uh, did statistical tests based on morphological, molecular, and graphic data that tests for phylogenetic autocorrelation between these things. So if creationism were true, you wouldn't necessarily expect any similar phylogenetic signal between independent lines of evidence if there was no real ancestry there in the first place, right? If there was no shared ancestry, you wouldn't expect these independent lines of evidence to converge on the same thing. Um, and he corrects for variation in ecology, incorporates fossil data in this study, and it strongly supports this specifically for primates, a primate common ancestry. Theobald, 2010, in Nature has done the same thing. Theobald 2011 has another paper on this. Penny in 2003, and Penny is one of the first people to do this in, in 1982 did this as well. So we have strong um, rejections of the creationist model that are done in a very explicit, statistical, rigorous, hypothetical, deductive ways. And by the way, when Nathaniel says um, deduction, it's not what we use in experimental science. It actually is. It's called the hypothetico-deductive uh, hypothetico method. That's the method of falsifying things that Karl Popper preferred, and it is actually a deductive method. So these refutations of creationist predictions were done via this deductive method of generating a hypothesis, making predictions, and measuring those predictions against the evidence, and falsifying them when they don't match. That's Popper's hypothetical deductive method right there. So next slide. So we can we can we can look at this in another way. We can look at um, uh, let's let's look at some mammals here, or, uh, mammals and a shark, um, a, uh, a cetaceans, a dolphin here, or a killer whale, or something like that, a cow, um, a, a manatee, and a shark. And so a common creation event says that these groups never shared a common ancestor. A common ancestry says they did, and they should, we should see this pattern when we look at the comparative data repeated over and over again across different independent lines of evidence. Uh, next slide. Now, you can say that there's a common design, but when you say there's a common design, you're start, you would have to group, say, the, the shark and the whale together, since they're, if, if you're designing a pelagic predator, you should design them the same. So they should fall out on the tree in the same place. And then another uh, marine animal, uh, manatee, should fall out close to them. None of them should be closer to the cow than they are to other things that are designed, designed to be in the water. 
right? So we have another prediction there from common design hypothesis. Next slide. But here again, the predictions of that common design hypothesis aren't met in the data, and the predictions of the common ancestry uh, hypothesis are. So let's just look at the case for whales in particular. Let's go through them. So next, here's a tree that has um, that uses a cytochrome B, which is um, a mitochondrial gene. So this is a gene in the mitochondria, the little loop of DNA that John uh, did a good job explaining about that mitochondria have. And another type of gene that's, that's not a protein coding gene, it encodes an RNA molecule that is its own end product. It just makes an RNA molecule that's the ribosomes in the mitochondria need. It's the 12S ribosomal RNA molecule. If you build a tree based on those um, sequences, what do you find? Well, you find that cetaceans, which are uh, circled in red, are next to hippos. And cetaceans and hippos together are embedded in the artiodactyls, which are hoofed mammals. Next slide. What if we do this for a nuclear gene? So let's say a casein gene. So all mammals have casein genes. They're produced in the milk. So it's a common gene in mammals. What do you have there? What does that tree produce? This is an independent. This is a different than mitochondrial gene. It's doing a diff totally different thing. The tree you produce there is you have whales next to hippos, and they're embedded within Artiodactyls, the hoof, even-toed hoof, hoofed mammals. Let's do another one. What's the next, the next slide, please? So what about DNA, DNA hybridization? So instead of looking at just um, single molecules, let's take the, the entire genomes of whales and let's heat them up so the two strands come apart. And now we'll cool, cool them down with strands from other animals. Okay, so let's heat them up from the whales, cool them down with the strands of, say, a hippo and a, a goat and a dog, et cetera, and we'll let them anneal together. So now you have these hybrid DNA molecules that half of it is whale and half of it is something else. Now we're going to heat them up to make them break apart. How much heat is it going to take to break apart? Well, the amount of heat it takes to break them apart tells you how similar they are across the whole genome. This is an old way of doing this before we could sequence whole genomes. When you do this very crude method, what do you find? Well, you find that whales, again, are embedded in the artiodactyls. You find another independent line of evidence telling the same thing. Next slide. So the next one here is we have these, these transposons. These are these little trans, transposable elements that get inserted into our genome at, at, with some probability. And what you find there is there's a, a insertion of a transposon, a retrotransposon called a sign element. That occurs a share between what? Cows, hippos, and whales. Again, pointing to the same answer. Next slide, please. Here's another tree that's more recently produced by Gatesy in 2013. And if you look at the blue here, that's where? In the archaeodactyl. Next slide. And if you look at this, these uh, tables at the, at the nodes, at the branch points of each part of the tree, this tells you how many genes sort of support that node, basically. This is multiple genes that we have that we analyze all at the same time for this. And where do the whales fall if you do multiple genes all at the same time? I think this has like 30 genes or something. They fall next to the hippos, and that group is embedded in the archaeodactyls. Next slide. Um, so some things that common ancestry is not. It's not simply just about traits. When uh, Jensen says that the origin of species is about the origin of traits, that's not entirely accurate. The origin of species is about the origin of lineages. Okay? And you can have traits originate outside of the origin of particular lineages. It's not simply about just similarity. So if, you build, if you're building trees off of dis distance measures and things like that, you're not explicitly testing models of evolution. It's not a linear progression. Uh, evolution is a branching uh, process that produces these big branching distributions, what we call Markov trees, um, of different organisms. It's not a linear thing of, of simple to complex over time. So again, it's not less complex to more. It's not different species mating to make new species. I mean, it's not necessarily to have complete genealogies even to support common ancestry. So we can augment with the fossil record. 
And all those examples from molecular genetics, what if you look to the fossil record for whales? What do you find? Well, you find fossil organisms that have the traits of whales and they have unique ankle bones that have only ever been found. First of all, they have legs, which is weird, but they have in those legs that they have, they have these unique ankle bones that have only been found where? Archaeodactyls. So again, you have the paleontology is now pointing you in the same direction. So evolution is about the evidence for common ancestry and about testing models of creationism or independent origins or whatever is about multiple lines of evidence and falsifying those things. And despite the fact that Nathaniel says that we're waiting to test the predictions of creationism, he's wrong because they've already been tested many, many times over and they failed every time. So that's it. Thanks. Let me unmute there. All right. We are now going to go into the open format between the two of you. Um, we scheduled, we slated this for uh, 30 minutes. So we're on the clock. And uh, since Dr. Mace just went, Dr. Jensen will begin with you if you want to either address any of the point brought up or ask a question, whichever way you want to um, approach. And we'll just let you guys dialogue back and forth. I wanted to ask a question. My goal in my presentation was to establish common ground. So I was going to invite Dr. Mays to comment on it and uh, say anything that he wanted to correct or maybe points where he agreed. Again, I think this is useful, not just for uh, I think this is useful for both sides to understand where the history has come from, why we're talking about what we're talking about, what we should be talking about when it comes to scientific disagreement. So if he's if he's comfortable with that, I'd love to hear his feedback. You, you want to hear with about what I agree with? Any comments you have uh, just for our, I guess, helpful for our audiences, both creationists and evolutionists say, hey, you know, this well, is. Well, I, I, I would say one thing I agree with is that uh, one adversary, if you want to call it that, of many creationists have been people like Jerry Coyne and, and Richard Dawkins and things like that, who have made the science out to be an argument against Christianity and an argument for atheism. I'm with you on that in that I'm against that approach to this because it has nothing to do with that at all. And when someone like Dawkins or especially Jerry Coyne and others and even PZ Myers has kind of done this from time to time, portrays this as something to where the science going with one hypothesis over another based on the data as something that precludes a certain religious belief necessarily. Um, I don't agree with that. I, I, I don't think that the science should be something that we use to bludgeon religious, religious people with. Um, I think those two areas are totally separate. So if if you you know are in agreement with that, then you know I I would join you in 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 arguing against people like Dawkins and Coyne on those points. I guess I was wondering if you could comment on what I presented and specifically the nature of science and what do we call science and non-science. Well, you you got sort of the nature of science wrong from the beginning because you you implied that deduction isn't um, experimental science. When actually Popper was very explicit about the hypothetical deductive method comes from, uh, you know, is, is the method that Popper championed. And it's that method that is where falsifiability comes from. So falsifiability itself is part of a deductive approach to doing science, not an inductive approach. So what would you say is the deductive method? So it's hard method for me to agree that. with with that. It went, you know, I, you didn't get it right to begin with. But, you know, so in general, you you're right. If, if, you're, if, you're saying, if you're saying that science should make predictions and that we should measure those predictions against the available evidence, that's exactly what we do. It's, 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 science in general doesn't have just one single method. It ha it's it's a, a diversity of approaches that we use where we use reason and evidence to explain the natural world. And we do that by matching models predictions against the data that we collect. Just like I showed in my presentation of how we, we do that when we're comparing independent ancestry versus common ancestry. So if that's your idea of science, I agree. 
Okay, so it sounds like there was just a difference of terminology. I'm familiar with the hypothetical deductive from my background reading, and anyway, I went with that one trying to describe how we're doing science. So I was curious if well, when you say that, when you process. say the deductive method isn't isn't how experimental science works, that's simply wrong. I guess I'm saying science by thinking. That's how I was defining it. Well, science by thinking is not. That's not. That's not the deductive. You know that you can do a deductive approach to science that is experimental. In fact. The falsifiability and, and the hypothesis testing approach of science is the deductive method by definition. So I asked my question, what's the uh, protocol for engagement? I think Kyle's on mute. Kyle, you're on mute. I am. Um, basically, it's just a, f a free flowing uh, conversation between the two of you. Um, since you just asked a question, Dr. Mays, if you want to ask any, um, you know, direct questions about um, anything that he brought up in, in the first, um, however you want to do it, we just want this to be kind of like an organic dialogue between the two of you without it being so, so rigid in. So, Nathaniel, do you, do you understand, do you understand what the coalescent is? Yep. What, what, could you describe for the people watching what the coalescent is? Uh, it's a complex statistical phenomena, so we'd have to get in some discussions of genetic drift, but uh, mutations happen over time, and due to some reproducing, some not reproducing, and a whole bunch of other genetic processes, lineages go extinct, uh, some lineages persist, so what we see here is a bunch of lineages today, let's say, for example, in mitochondrial DNA that coalesce back to a common ancestor due to these uh, several genetic processes. What several genetic processes are? I mean, I'm asking because in one of your papers, you mentioned that you used the what you call the coalescent equation that you took from an undergraduate textbook, you took from Fatuma, and it basically was just the mutation rate times time. Do you think that's the coalesce? The co it cut out. Say that again. Coalescent equation. He's asking you, do you think that's the entire coalescent equation? Uh, you you're you're that's cutting the out. That's coalescent equation, like there's a coalescent equation and that's it, like you said in your paper. Uh, I don't think that I was trying to apply in the paper. I was following protocol as it was practiced in the literature. Well, that's not the literature, though. No one cites an undergraduate textbook to discuss the coalescent, uh, coalescent theory. Much less do they cite this simple kind of algebraic relationship between time and 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 genetic distance. That's not that's then, not really what the coalescent is. There's not one coalescent equation. There's lots of them to describe this. this process. Uh huh. And uh, then why I were the other authors like. of the human mitochondrial DNA using the same thing? What about human cited, mind? What I actually cited Fudiyama. Futuma and I cited a paper that used the same thing, basically. But that's not the coalescent equation. That's that's not what it is. I've used there's, coalescent there's not and one I've used coalescent. divergence, and I've followed the uh, the mainstream literature practice. You actually didn't. <laughs> there are I can send you hundreds of papers on the coalescent, and and none of them describe it the way they described it. I mean, I can explain it to you. So, for instance, um, do you do you think that all loci have the same coalescent time? Let's back up for a second. We might get far afield here. So, uh, John Perry made some important points last night uh, on mitochondrial DNA and the predictions that it makes. That would be a great topic to discuss. Well, I asked you though, do, what I, do what all I know and don't know? I think that's an important lesson. question too. What I'd rather discuss though is the science and what makes the best testable predictions. And uh, one of the things I was hoping we could discuss before we get into the coalescent, which is an important topic, uh, I was wondering if you could show me. I, I really appreciate your presentation, by the way. I, I, I learn a lot from them. I appreciate your research. Excited about the genome research you're doing. Uh, it's a presentation you've given before, which I enjoyed, but that was also my concern because I, I, 
I didn't see much that actually addressed what was in my book. So I was wondering if we, before we get into the coalescent, you could pick one of the points that you were making and show me from my book where that prediction came first, from that was being tested. First of all, it does address your book because in the book, in actually um, chapter five, I believe, you talk pretty extensively about how common ancestry and common design um, are not mutually exclusive, so to speak. Um, and then you talk about how common design makes predictions and you go on to say that those predictions haven't been tested. So you clearly say this, this is chapter five of the book, you go on about this uh, pretty extensively. And then also in the beginning of the discussion today, you said the same thing. You said, we have to wait a year to, you know, maybe we'll come back in a year and we'll test the predictions of common ancestry. But I wanna back up a Dr. second. Major, you're, you're, break, you're breaking up a little bit. Dr. Mays, you're breaking up a little bit. I think that maybe he's not fully hearing the question. So be fair to him. Can you repeat your question in its entirety about the FOSI? Yeah. So the question was, can you okay. hear me now? Yes. Okay. The question was, do mitochondria, mitochondrial sequences have the same, do, do all gene sequences anywhere have the same coalescence? This gets into a and number of things. If you're avoiding that question, if you're, excuse me? This gets into a number of topics that I covered in my book, and I want to make sure we're on the same page with the book first. Yes, I know it, it does It does have to do with the book. It has to do with whether or not you understand what the coalescent approach is. So again, I'm asking you, do all loci have the same coalescent time? I guess here's my point, and my hope was we could have a good scientific discussion instead of an insulting one. Uh, well, I'm not insulting you. I'm the, asking you a question. Most of what, well, you started with a bunch of insults. I'm not interested really in returning that. Uh, but most of what you said in your presentation, I would have a hard time finding in what I published. And I know Shannon Q last night was asking that we not attack straw men. So I was wondering if you could just pick one of your points and show me the specifics of how you derived what you're calling my prediction and show how it's falsified because Actually, some of the things you were saying were the predictions I said the opposite in my book. So if you just pick one and show me from the book that I claim this is a prediction of the creation model, I think we could have a good discussion so, that way. Just to be clear, the coalescent is a relevant topic to the subjects in your book and in your papers. Oh, absolutely. I'm asking, and I'm asking if you, I'm not trying to insult you. I'm asking questions that are relevant to the topics covered in the book. If you can't answer that question, then I guess we're just forced to move on. And I can the answer that question I'm, for you instead. The reason I'm bringing up the book is because how you answer that question deals with a lot of the topics that I bring up. So are all mutations, are all differences the result of mutation? Are some of those differences the result of creative diversity? We're talking about very different processes uh, and it gets a much more complex discussion. We're talking about coalescence and it's gonna be difficult to not talk past each other unless we're talking about hypotheses that I'm actually proposing. I can, I can give you a simple example. Let's say you have four sequences in this, this is one generation. There's four sequences in the past. Okay, so let's say we pick one of those ones and we say this one is a copy from this one. So what's the chance that this one is also a copy from that one? One in four, right? So there's, there's a one in four chance that you would have that one in four, right? Now, if you have Coalescence is a function of population size, that it, it's different from mitochondrial versus nuclear DNA. This is all textbook here, stuff, yeah? Here, well, you could have just answered that. So here you have, what's the chance that this one and this one are now a thing? Well, now it's one, two, three. The, the difference between mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA is that mitochondrial DNA is only passed on by females and it's only half. Whereas every two parents has, they have two nuclear alleles. So the effective population size, 
for a mitochondrial locus is one fourth what it is for a nuclear locus. Yep. So just like this example shows, no, that's not what you said in your paper. So because what that means is this, that if you have a coalescent time for a mitochondrial gene, you're going to have another coalescent time for a nuclear gene that's four yep. times older. Yeah. So any coalescent time that you have for a mitochondria that predicts that things go back, say, 6,000 years, you're going to have not just one, but you'll have actually a Poisson distribution of coalescent times with a big long tail like this that's older than the coalescent time for mitochondrial DNA. So all the genes, whether they're mitochondrial or nuclear, have different coalescent times. And if for mitochondrial all loci, all the, the coalescent time is much more... It has nothing to do with mutation at all. It has to, it, it has to do... It, it has to do... Because you're counting backwards in time, it has to do mainly with the effect of population size. So just like here, I never in this example said anything about mutation. But clearly you can see the chance that if you go back one generation, if it's four, is greater than if it's 10. So that means the time that you can trace back two sequences to a single coalescent is going to be more for the one with the bigger population size than with the smaller. Oh, yeah. And that's true regardless of the mutation rate. And so that's, that's not something you talk about. And there's a whole plethora of, of that's just the very, very basic undergrad version of this. And, yeah, and I agree that with all that. that. That's every, what uh, every gene, on the covers every gene is going to have an end. Every gene is going to have an independent history associated with it. And so you, you get assume. all these genealogies that you're going to use to uh, determine what the species history is. And it's going to be different. So if you trace back a mitochondrial coalescent time to 6,000 years, then that only means that there's a nuclear time that's much, much older than that waiting for it in the background. So Implicit in this theory is the fact that these differences arise by mutation, and that's a major difference between my explanation for nuclear DNA and the prevailing mainstream one. And I'm quite familiar with that. They don't, that you, they don't arise through mutation? Did you Over read time? chapter eight? Yeah, and I think in there, you, you, I don't know if it's in that chapter, but you said that in the book, you said that mutation is responsible for the diversity we see in DNA sequences. Except at the so very you beginning, when you just read chapter eight. Well, I mean, you, you can explain it. You can explain how you get a mitochondrial time that goes back six thousand years. How can there be older times than that? How would you say is my position on the origin of nuclear DNA? The origin of nuclear DNA? Well, I think nuclear your position DNA on the origin of all DNA ultimately is God created it. Oh, that's incorrect. You don't think God created DNA? What do you think I said in my book? Well, you can explain it. I don't have it memorized. If, you, if I'm going to mischaracterize it, you can explain it right now. It's your chance. That's why I want you to go through all the examples you gave. Just pick one. And I want you to show me from my book. John Perry actually mentioned this last night. Uh, he's actually read what I've written. And he says uh, he knows that one of the reasons I give for why so, so, so many people, 97% of the scientific community, disagrees with what I say. Uh, one of the things I say is I think so many people haven't read it, and I'd like to see some evidence from your slides that you've read the book. So I'd like you to pick one of the examples that you give for testing common ancestry versus separate ancestry. For the record, I actually talk, uh, that's a whole other separate topic, but I'd, I'd like to see from my book, uh, one of the tests you give, the falsification of common ancestry versus separate ancestry, how that separate ancestry prediction flows from what I've written. So to be clear, you would say that families look like this at the family level. So we have three families, A, B, and C. They started at a particular time and went on, and they might have diversified into species within those families, but those family lineages started at one time and they never had any history of a shared ancestry prior. Is that correct? At, this, at the organismal level, yes. So then there's this argument that's a little hard to follow, that there's some 
genetic hocus pocus going on in here that was created at the inception of these things that's creating the pattern somehow. But why are so those patterns I, there? What do I predict as the pattern for separate ancestry? Well, I'm asking you that question. What do, what do you predict as the pattern for separate? I, I mean, I think when I read ch through chapter five in particular, I, I see that you're saying that the, your model makes the same predictions as the common ancestry model. Is that not correct? That you say that sort and of what throughout are those, the book. What are those predictions? That you would make some tree like such. If you looked at the I guess data. What I'm asking is, why don't you pull up one of your slides that you say falsifies separate ancestry? Well, if somebody can pull up my slides, go ahead. Go to number just, just seven. Pick any one of the seven. tests. Slide, slide number seven. There you go. Why don't you explain for our audience how the separate ancestry prediction was derived so that someone can repeat it to somebody else and then connect it so to what I said in my book. This, the separate ancestry prediction was derived based on the fact that you have all these protein coding sequences that they looked at. They made 50 independent data sets from uh, these primate families, families within the primate order. And then they said, okay, if they share valine across all of them, we're going, to, we're going to randomly pick a codon for valine. Now, what, what your model would say and what you say in the book is you talk a little bit about how there's codon bias and there's some functional reasons for why some families would have some codons versus other codons. Um, at other times, you seem to suggest that there's neutral variation is a real thing. And so it's a little unclear as to which one you would apply in this particular case. But the, the independent ancestry model would say that if you, they never shared a common ancestor, then what piece of DNA they have to encode for valine there, because they all have valine, should vary. And it should vary in a way that is different than the way that it varies if under a common ancestry model. And in one of the levels of this analysis here are different models that specifically bias codons. So it actually accounts for this sort of bias that there should be some codons that should be more prevalent than others, even though they produce the same amino acid. So it actually deals with the premise that you bring up in your book. And other people have tested this idea that there's some functional uh, uh, relationship between uh, among codons, um, where some codons, synonymous codons, even though they make the same amino acid and they don't appear to make any difference, that they can be used to speed up. You say they use to speed up or slow down transcription and, and things like that, depending on what codons they have there. Now, people are aware of these biases. And they incorporate for them. And so the authors of this study actually incorporated for different kind of codon biases in the analysis, and they still produce the differences. So you can. So I, is that tying it to your book enough? I mean, you just said you, you would say sure that what these, my prediction these, was this variation is due to design. You said that these variations are due to design. So that there's there's design <laughs> reasons or functional reasons for protein coding genes to have um different codons that encode the same amino acid why don't you explain what that score represents it's actually quite fuzzy for me on the screen the score the entropy score so that tells you how variable that tells you how variable it uh the if you just select at random how variable it is between the different lineages for each amino acid. And you should expect more variation if each one of the families never shared a common ancestor. Because if they shared a common ancestor, then that means there's some change that happened in the past that they share that will make it less variable. So there's a reason for why there's less, what they call a measure of entropy, but it's sort of like a, it's sort of like a variation. It, it, it's basically, it's a statistic that quantifies 
the amount of variation where the values are categorical, basically. Um, so there's a reason to, to suspect that in a common ancestry model, you would have less variation than in an independent origins model. Now, you so would argue might... in your book that there are functional reasons for why there's that variation there. So you would say that the black distribution there that they say is the, the um, sort of creationist model in this, in this case um, would be explained by some functionality somewhere. But there's no evidence of that functionality. And where there's bias in the codons, they took that into account. So where in so my can, book did I make predictions uh, about the amount of variability yeah. among these various groups? Well, you probably missed that prediction because maybe you didn't understand the implications of what you were saying. But the implication of your theory is that there should be independent origins of different families. And if that's the, the idea that you're positing, then that's going to be a prediction of that model. Actually, what you showed is the opposite of what I predicted in my book. Well, ex explain it. I was talking, and my book predicts nested hierarchies. It really doesn't predict anything about the level of variability among these separate families. Instead, what I show is that the way to predict, the way to compare evolution and creation head to head is on the level of function. So I would say that test you showed is not actually, it's, it might be a refutation of separate ancestry, but it's not what I'm proposing in the book. Can you pick another one? Why should we focus on function? In fact, if you look at variation that occurs independent of any variation in function, then it's a much better test because then you've removed this idea that there should be some, um, and this is a classic sort of approach in phylogenetics, is that you don't want to use characters that are functional or genes that are functional in a sense. You wanna use neutral genetic markers. And in fact, if you understood the coalescent and you're using the coalescent, the coalescent is based exclusively on neutral, var neutral variation. So if you're saying there's no neutral variation or neutri neutral variation doesn't matter for your model, then you shouldn't ever be using the coalescent because it's predicated on neutral variation. I don't say any so either I don't of those things. So I don't know things, where this idea is that where you can't, I don't know where this idea is coming from is where you can't pay any attention to neutral variation at all. I don't say that in the book. Well, Tell me what your predictions would be for, for variation that's truly neutral in this case. I guess I'm challenging, because you're the one who made the claim, that the book is riddled with errors, has been refuted many times. And my pushback is, you need to show me from the book that you're actually there testing what I proposed and not There are errors. One, one is how you discuss the coalescent is just simply wrong. So that's a big error. Um, another uh, error is just little, there's just little errors. like. You know, there's a part in the biogeography uh, section, I think it's chapter four, where you say that there's uh, river otters native to Hawaii. There aren't. Or then you say that talking about the biogeography of ratites, which are like the big flightless birds and antinomus like um, uh, kia, uh, emu and cassowary and ostrich and rhea. And you talk about how rheas and, and ostriches are more similar to one another. Well, they're really not, actually. So, so there, there are errors in your book. It's not Those are error important free. Questions. I, would, I would love to discuss them, but I, would, I want to finish what you had presented first since that's the topic at hand. And I'm hoping you can show me and pick another one of your slides where you say creationism, separate ancestry. My book has been refuted. I'd like to see you show. So let's, go to slide, let's go to slide 12. And so let's talk about these evolution of these mammals. And so if, if function is what you're saying should, if function is the thing that's important in determining these trees, why don't we get whales and sharks and manatees on the same branch of a tree? If function were truly the important thing in determining relationships. And so, so we I talk about this... that pretty so again, this is a question, this tree is drawn based on variability and I don't have predictions based on variability. No, a, this, this tree is just my two hypotheses. Trees are hypotheses. 
That's that's all trees are ultimately in the end. One and where is the left is, hypothesis in my book? I didn't you just say that you emphasize that nested hierarchies should be based on function? I said, what would I say in the book? Which I'd encourage everyone to read to get a sense for what I'm actually saying. Uh, that the design model what I'm proposing predicts the existence of nested hierarchies. And by the way, I have a vested interest in knowing what is separately related and what's not related. This is a very different creationist view than 1859. Uh, it's, it's not as simple as everything is designed. Uh, this is young earth creationists have to try to separate between what they think are the original created kinds, which have separate ancestries and those members that do have a common ancestor. And so I have a vested interest in detecting signatures of non-design versus design. And I'd love to have them. Uh, and to make a long story short, it's the genetic clocks that I'm primarily using, I think is the way forward to answer that question. But uh, in terms of the variability between things that have separate ancestry, you won't find a prediction on that in my book. Instead, what I say is, uh, an indirect way to test this is if one model says separate ancestry, another model says common ancestry, this leads to, and I go through the math and one of my papers, first papers from 2013, 34 page paper, detailed derivation of this leads to very specific different predictions on function. It arises out of a, 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 an article, I think it's on talk origins, it talks about neutral variation, all these sorts of things. These are, there, there are implicit predictions made about amino acid function, about third codon position function, Anyway, so what I've laid out in the book is very specific predictions about whether or not these have function uh, and how those turn out have indirect implications for the ancestry question because they're based on these different models, but you won't find something talking about variability between what I'm proposing as separate kinds. Well, if, if you're saying function, why, why wouldn't you get the tree where sharks and manatees and whales are on one branch? Even though they never shared a common ancestry, you would get a nested hierarchy that would put them there because of a functional similarity. Why don't you get that? My book doesn't make that prediction. It doesn't deal with that. Well, I'm asking you what your I'm asking you what your what your model would say for that pattern. What would it say? Uh, it doesn't have a prediction on pattern. Instead, what it says is here's if we if we take as the starting points various positions on ancestry. This leads to predictions on whether or not these sequences under consideration are functional or simply neutral. And Talk Origins discusses that in detail, and that was the basis then in 2013 for me deriving a long paper, uh, making other predictions that experiments will eventually show to be true or false. So I'd like to hear some other discussion well, of things from my book say, that I've said that have been one falsified. Thing you say in the book, one thing you, you say in the book is in light of these parallels, and you talk about the parallels between technology and and classification, basic cl clustering of living things. In light of these perils, we'd be justified in claiming that the hier hierarchical pattern of life strongly suggests that it was the result of a deliberate design. So mm -hmm. what is it about the hierarchy that we have where whales are embedded within hoofed mammals that is that tells you that that, what is about that pattern tells you that that's deliberate design, as you said in your your book. What I say in the book is that the fact that a nested hierarchy exists is consistent with the hypothesis of design. And we can take that a step further and say, okay, uh, I'm going to say that whales and land mammals have separate ancestors. The evolutionary model says they have a common ancestor. Then we can compare specific nuclear proteins, mitochondrial proteins, nuclear DNA sequences, mitochondrial DNA sequences. And there should be a prediction within the evolutionary model as to whether or not those sequences under comparison are simply neutral clocks over time, or whether they're performing some function within each of these respective creatures. And that's where the rub is, and that's where I've laid out a very detailed model uh, that things we can test in the lab that are being tested currently uh, and not yet resolved. I mean, you're not really answering the question. I mean, you, you said in the book that hierarchical patterns strongly suggest that it's the result of deliberate design. So can you be specific about why is it that you have a dolphin is closer to a goat than it is to a manatee? Why is that pattern of hierarchical pattern consistent with design? Uh, the book doesn't go into any further detail than that. Just the fact that a nested hierarchy exists is the point. So you're avoiding the question. 
No, I'm saying the model doesn't make predictions beyond that in that specific so you pattern. Know, you understand, right, that no one nested hierarchical pattern based on one set of data is evidence for common ancestry. It's the consilience mm -hmm. we have along independent lines of evidence. Many of those evidence either vary in function from one thing to another, or they are not associated with variation in function at all. Um, introns, for instance. So, for instance, when we construct phylogenetic trees, we use uh, nuclear introns in addition to mitochondrial DNA. Um, nuclear introns can accumulate variation more so than the rest of the gene can, and so we can, they're more phylogenetically informative in that way. And we, we're not plagued with these issues, basically. So, you know, I mean, I, I, I can't tell really if you're saying, because sometimes you say in the book neutral variation exists and it explains the patterns we see. And then other times, like when you talk about, well, now you talk about the coalescent. And then other times you say that um, it's, it's all just looks like it's neutral, but it's really functional. We'll find out someday if it's functional. Actually, I make a lot of very specific statements, both in the book and especially in the end notes. And I'm still waiting for... Uh you to point out one of those. And I'm disappointed you haven't been able to really give me more from the book and that, that directly addresses what I say. What I'd like to propose for the future is this, uh, and we didn't really have time to discuss mitochondrial DNA. Here's a testable prediction that's in the book that we can both evaluate side by side. I think this is a pro-science way of taking the debate forward. Uh, what I say in the book is that if mitochondrial DNA differences are explicable over 6,000 years, well, the last 6,000 years, we all agree, is the history of civilization. So you should be able to see the stamp of this, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, Genghis Khan's Empire, all of these things should be recognizable within our mitochondrial DNA differences, and uh, not so much if mitochondrial DNA differences represent hundreds of thousands of years of history. One of the best test cases that will distinguish between evolution and creation is the transatlantic slave trade. And we've got 2,504 individual mitochondrial DNA sequences within the 1,000 Genomes Project that's freely available. Anyone can download, anyone can do this experiment. And i am spent two years on this, close to being finished. I think we have a, a, a detectable signature. So why don't we do an experiment in parallel? You can, this is your expertise. You can download well, those 1,000 genome sequence, make, make, a, Nathaniel, make a prediction. Nathaniel, we just talked about this. For you to say that mitochondrial diversity only goes back 6,000 years, you're saying by necessity that the coalescent of the, of the samples of mitochondrial DNA we have today can be traced back, so they all trace back, those mitochondrial lineages trace back to one within 6,000 years. Now, yeah, if they I, trace I back to one, very detailed. Okay, so that means that by, I mean, that means that nuclear genes have to be older, have older coalescent times than 6,000 years. So how can you have one locus, the mitochondria, only go back 6,000 years but other genes go back longer than 6,000 years, if you, that idea of yours is correct. You're only basing this only on mitochondrial DNA, and you, in the book you generally avoid any discussion of any kind of nuclear markers at all, which the irony is, now that we have better sequencing method, most of the discussion on things like mutation rates and phylogenetics and things like that are involving nuclear markers, especially even whole genomes. Um, at the whole Steve. genome level. Steve, you read the book? Just to let you guys know, we, we, yeah. let you guys know we, we, we are running short on time. Um, go ahead, if we continue with this uh, line of, of questioning. Please finish up on the mitochondrial DNA. We do have a few super chats to get to, though. So if you got to wrap this up on the mitochondrial DNA, and then we'll, you guys mind if we go to a couple of questions? Steve, so you I read hope the book? you see my point. I hope you see my point. It's a legitimate I, point. If you're I, I've, I've tried to read the book. I've got through a lot of it. Um, I honestly, past the beginning part, when it gets to the phylogenetics, I am it, I, I don't understand it enough to even weigh I've in read it topic. twice. I read it over twice. The short answer is I've got an entire chapter on nuclear DNA. It's incorrect to say I don't deal with it at all. And it's a very uh, chapter different model eight, right? you're articulating here. Again, again, like I said in my introductory remarks, the main errors, they're not the only errors, but the main errors in your book are errors of omission. And when you talk about nuclear DNA, you don't talk about these well-known facts about nuclear DNA, is that they have a distribution of coalescent times that tends to be older 
than the coalescent times for mitochondrial DNA. You're right, you don't really talk about that at all in your book. And that's what I'm saying the problem is. It's not Actually, so much what you did say, book, it's what you left out in the book. The same thing happens in mutation rates in your book. So for instance, you talk about a little bit about mutation rates and you have a paper where you cited three papers that are pedigree papers, where you get a, a very, um, a very, let's say, optimistic mutation rate from that. But what we see is that when we really look at mutation, and what you do is you throw away any estimates of mutation rate that are based on anything except for pedigrees. Because you don't That's believe in those times. That's because I don't have a circular argument. It's a circular argument so unless you use pedigrees. It's, not a, it's actually not a circular argument. There are independent ways saying. to calibrate. Here's, here's why it's yeah. circular. The point in question is the time scale. So to assume a time scale to get a mutation rate assumes the very point in question. It's not circular because the calibrations for the time scale are independent of the measures of the DNA. So you're not getting the time from the DNA. You're calibrating the time based on an independent measure. So it's not circular at all. And people are very good at this. And you do this throughout the book where you throw out well-studied areas of science. For instance, so you say that I'm going to ignore any studies of ancient DNA because I just don't believe that it's reliable. When you were at Harvard, probably right down the hall in Harvard Medical School was this guy, David Reich, who wrote an excellent book that I recommend for everybody, who's been sequencing whole genomes from everything from Neanderthals to archaic humans, and they've been uh, added to our understanding of how human populations move and how they exchange genes and all that, all from ancient DNA samples, and they're very good at it. And to just dismiss that whole field as if you know enough about it to where you've decided that it's baloney is blows my mind because these are some of the top people in this field of work and you just throw it out. And then if you go even deeper, what you get is when you look at pedigree mutation rates, if you get mutation rates from pedigrees, they start off very high, right? And the reason is a lot of the mutations you measure, you measure are things that are going to get weeded out over time. So for instance, if you measure, even if you measure like from parent to offspring, you're not getting any mutations that occurred that made zygotes die. So any lethal mutations you're missing. So even that is an underestimate of the mutation rate. What we want to use in coalescent theory and in phylogenetics are not mutation rates, but substitution rates. And so substitution rates are the rates at which genes in the population spread to fixation in the population. And so as we measure mutation rates at pedigrees, they're very high, but as they go down, you start to weed out a lot of these deleterious mutations and they even out in the long scale like this. So when you measure mutation or substitution across long scales, it actually starts to equal a substitution rate. And that's what we're interested in these things. That's the relevant metric. If you're overestimating it by using just these pedigrees and not controlling for the fact that you're, you're not measuring necessarily neutral variation, then you can't use these models anymore, like coalescent models and things like that. We, we, we do have to start wrapping this up, unfortunately. So we do have a couple questions. Um, I don't have time I to read all the super chats. We, yes, just absolutely, got, but I just want to say real quick, we will, be, we will be reading all the super chats in the after show and uh, getting some of these qu more questions answered. So if you didn't get your question answered, I apologize. We are have we do have time time constraints, but play, by all means, uh, Dr. Jensen, uh, go ahead and, and respond to that if you wish, and then we're going to ask you a few questions. Yes, I think Dr. May has been about three points. Unfortunately, each of those three points do not represent what I say in the book. So I'd love to continue it further, but we keep going back to the same problem that what he's saying and criticizing isn't actually what I said. Go ahead. Do, do you wish to, real quick, um, if, if Dr. Mays doesn't mind, do you want to put forth a single summation of an argument that you are making so there is no straw man, as we had talked about last night, um, something that is just straightforward from your book that is easily digestible for everybody, including the audience and everybody watching, that he can address from directly your book that you have posited as a hypothesis or something along the lines of what you are, um, are, are saying is the case that leads you to the, the the narrative that it shows some kind of six thousand year, um, well, from the from the empty nuclear DNA, I mean the mitochondrial DNA from six thousand years without any kind of nuclear as as Dr. May said precursors. 
Yeah, so the book addresses to apply? mutation rates versus mutation rates, the role of natural selection, time dependency. Uh, I'm very familiar with the young earth, excuse me, with the evolutionary literature on this topic. And my main point, and actually John Perry didn't quite capture uh, my main question to my opponents. My main question to my opponents is what testable predictions does your model make? And let's go out and do it. So to me, the ideal case to do this, and again, I put this in print in the book, is let's look for the signature of the history of civilization. For example, the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, I'm doing the experiment right now. Herman Mays can at the click of a button, download all those all those sequences. He's got the software to do, uh, create a tree and, and, and do the sorts of analysis to see where this split between Africans and African Americans happened and, and look at a calibration point, which we have very detailed historical data, 12 million slaves. You can know that the ports that came from the ports that disembarked. It's a fantastic and very sad historical event by which we can do this. So my main point that I'm hoping audiences will see is this is a different debate. Uh, uh, what I'm proposing makes testable false viable predictions. It's an active research program that I'm currently pursuing and inviting people to join me on. Except Is that a lot of the African slaves that came over were already admixed with other populations before they came over. And, and also, that's if you're only going to use something you can evaluate with the data. If, but, but people have already done this, Nathaniel. That's what I'm saying. It's... The errors in the book are errors you don't want to talk about because they're errors you leave out. They're errors of omission. People have already studied this extensively. Um, like I said, you, you could have walked down the hall when you were in graduate school to David Reich's lab and talked to him about all this stuff, and he'd be the best person on planet Earth next to Svante Paolo or somebody like that to talk about. They've Here's already my advice done anyone this. listening. Find someone who can download well, well, the 2,500 sequences on the thousand genomes project look where the african-americans show up you might be surprised um, this, this actually is a good time for a question on this that's related to this because we got to get these questions and we, we are running out of time yes, fast um one person had asked um and this is directly to dr jeanson um did you seek reviews from biologos or any or other Christian organizations are only from atheists. You mentioned you mentioned uh, Dr. P. Z. Myers, who we who, who we know quite well, Dr. Uh, Dawkins, and a few other uh, people. Uh, Coin, who I've, I've reached out to before as well. He he doesn't seem to to answer these kind of things. Um, but did you try to um, ask any of the other Christian organizations like BioLogos? And if and if not, why did you focus particularly on the atheist speakers? Good question. So with respect to BioLogos, uh, I've debated Dennis Venema. You can see that online. That was at a seminary in April of last year. Uh, I've documented the fact that he did, really doesn't read what we publish, and I didn't see that as profitable. So, uh, and he's probably one of the only contacts I have. I, okay, I had I spent a four-hour lunch with Gerald Falk. So in 2015, he and I were at the Evangelical Theological Society meeting as a part of a panel discussion to discuss genetics and human origins and that sort of thing. He made as a condition of this, a condition of his participation in the event to uh, have a four hour lunch with me like two months prior, which I agreed to. And we had a really nice time until the end. And I started showing him some of the scientific data. And I said, actually, the way the conversation went was he said, you know, it's too bad we can't have more of these discussions because my logos is very much about reaching the Christian community with evolution. And I said, actually, I think my organization would be quite fine with us having some more of these discussions, but it would really help my discussions if you would review my papers. And at that point, the conversation switched and he's retired and he took two days out of his life just to have lunch with me. He said, I'm too busy, I don't have time for that. And so I thought, well, I didn't, I was a non sequitur. I Can I ask one? <laughs> we're, we were used uh, to non sequiturs, trust me. Can I ask one question real quick? It's a simple one. So Nathaniel, it seems to me from reading the book that you are really pushing this idea that creationism is falsifiable. Is that is that correct? That's the central thesis. You're aware that in in your statement of faith that you signed to be an a, a, a employee of AIG, it's that it's like what Ken Ham said when he debated Bill Nye. When Bill Nye asked him, "What evidence would can we give you to make you?" let go of this idea and he said none and the statement of faith actually says that there is no evidence at all that's conceivable that could contradict with the answers in genesis view of the bible so do you view this idea of creationism your version of creationism as falsifiable as at odds with your statement of faith uh not at all 
So the statement of faith is really a religious philosophical summary and doesn't preclude at all making testable predictions. So the leadership is but fully on board it, it with what says, I'm doing. It says explicitly that there's no conceivable possibility that what's been revealed in the Bible could be shown to be false. Yeah. So how can and that be falsifiable? Because uh, you could very easily find some testable predictions. You'd actually have to, well, there are, there are, those are separate issues. The, philo the phil philosophy and the, uh, the science are separate issues and many people confuse them. And the bottom line is I've got a book out that has in print numerous testable predictions that you can go and evaluate in the lab. And the leadership is, is completely on board with that. And, and I'm anxious to have people join me in that. Uh, we have one last question. Well, says, um, actually, what it says, let me be clear on this. It says in the statement of faith, by definition, no apparent, perceived, or claimed evidence in any field, including history and chronology, can be valid if it contradicts the scriptural record. So how then is the scriptural view, which is where your creationism idea comes, how can it be falsifiable? And you also agree to that statement. It's a question that trips many people up, but it exists. I've got those in print, and they're published by the uh, publishing arm. The CEO of the Master Books sits on our board, and they put that book in print. Well, uh, we, we we have one I last question. I'd like to give us out. Okay. Uh, we, we got we got to move on. Unfortunately, um, mystery. Rational mind ask. Um, I have a question for Jensen. Uh, you cite pedigree studies to get your mutation rate. In one of your papers, you mentioned that you can't be sure if you're getting uh, gametic or somatic mutations. In the book, you don't mention this important caveat. Why not? Good. So this is this is a very helpful question uh, for a number of reasons. One is if you Google like Jensen mutation rate, you'll come across the Filthy Monkey Men blog, where they basically imply I've confused. And Herman Mays actually has a comment on that from April, re-asking a question. You can see him there. Uh, where they're saying I'm confusing the somatic mutation rate with the germline mutation rate. So that really what I'm detecting in mutation in, in these in this particular study. And let me back up for a sec. You can you can see this all documented in my papers, the references there and get the primary literature. But one of the main studies uh, that I was using in this particular example was a massive study of Sardinians and their mitochondrial DNA. And I was deriving a mutation rate from that. Uh, and I and, and this filthy monkey man says, Jensen missed this point. Well, actually, another example of people not reading what I write, I give that exact caveat in my paper from 2015. So uh, the testable hypothesis that people don't read our literature is once again fulfilled. Uh, and so I appreciate the question because uh, it shows that this person has actually read the literature. So why didn't I why didn't I give that caveat in in the book itself? There's four reasons why. Number one, if you look again at the history of the papers I published, uh, there's there's been a, there's sort of two sets of mainstream mitochondrial pedigree mutation rate studies. The first set, there's twelve or more of them, I think. Look at the D loop. It's just a subset of the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, there, those are germline because they're looking at multi generation pedigrees. You can look up all that literature; it's publicly available. Some of it's behind paywalls, but anyway, it's out there. And that gave a, a mutation rate, one mutation, it's, it's one times 10 to the minus fifth mutations, I think, per base pair per generation. The second set of mainstream papers looks at the entire mitochondrial genome. And there I took all the data and it came out basically the same, 0. 0.95 times 10 to the minus six, it's basically rounded to the same number. So there's across multiple studies, a strong agreement, actually there's five reasons I didn't get the caveat in the book. Uh, so the first one is there's agreement between these two sets. Second is, the paper wasn't aware of 2016, Mark Stone King's lab, one of the leaders in mitochondrial DNA. He's got a paper, I think it's Genome Research 2016, like 228 Dutch pedigrees. There he measures uh, the effective, he, he measures the mitochondrial bottleneck. And if you look at coalescent theory, you'll find out that the bottleneck size is equivalent to the population size. And there's a whole lot, so John Perry didn't get a chance to get into this last night, but actually what happens in mitochondrial DNA is there's a mutation, there's heteroplasmy that drifts to fixation. Anyway, you know, if, if you know the bottleneck size, that's, a, that's an indirect way of getting the mutation rate, and it gives basically the same answer as those other two. Thirdly, uh, or fourth, or whatever number I'm on now, this leads again to testable predictions about dating the transatlantic slave trade. That's basically a mutation rate-free study. It's looking at branch length ratios, which is effectively a substitution rate measurement. This is giving, and it, it, 
anyway, it'd be a whole other discussion presentation to discuss that. Hopefully there'll be a paper that comes up this fall. Uh, but that's in agreement with it. Plus, lastly, and one of this is one of the things I point out in the comments, you can see one of the in, in the comments of that filthy monkey men study. Uh, in the book, I go through multiple other species that give a similar answer. So the fact that it gives consistent answers across these multiple independent data sets, it's leading to testable predictions that are working. That's given me confidence that, in fact, we probably are looking at germline. Um, before we go any further, just to let you guys know, um, links are going to be heading out right now for the after show on this. Um, I do want to specifically thank the Super Chats we weren't able to read out, which we will in the after show. But I do want to thank Jamie. Um, I do want to thank Jade, Puffalepicus, and especially Ruif, um, and Shane, and a few other people that have, had asked questions. Unfortunately, we, we are having a time constraint issue, but we are sending out the links now. The after show will be on this channel. Um, it will be through uh, vMix just like this. So if you have any last minute questions, please get them in now, but we are going to be wrapping up. Uh, Dr. Mays, do you want to address that particular question? Because I think it's only fair since it was asked to Dr. Deanson, you kind of Which maybe do a rejoinder on it. One. Either the mutation rate one or dealing with the, the gametic or somatic line, why it wasn't mentioned in the... In the in well, the I, I would say his mutation rates are, are because they use pedigrees and they ignore everything else, they're not substitution rates. Which is what's important to measure. And if if Dave can throw up slide twenty four real quick, I can show you what the problem of with this is. It'll be just very quick. It's a very graphic thing. So here is um, from Endicott two thousand nine. If you see that fuzzy line at the bottom, those are relative rates. Um, for different parts of the mitochondrial genome. And you see that they're not the same throughout. Now, uh, the most uh, mutation-prone region is the control region, especially these what we call hypervariable regions. And you see the red dot on there. The green dot is, is sort of where the, is, is sort of a better absolute measure of what the mutation rate is there. And the red dot is the one that Nathaniel uses. If you, you, you see that it's not, if you even out all the measures across there, it would be much lower than the mutation rate that he uses there. And, and this one, again, is based on internal calibration based on archaeological evidence for the occupation of Australasia and then external calibrations that he doesn't accept. So, so he's basically saying that he accepts pedigree uh, mutation rates, which aren't substitution rates, and he ignores all the other estimates of substitution rates that employ methodology that he doesn't agree with. So that's that's a nice figure, though, to show that how variable the mutation rate is, even just within the mitochondrial genome. And then if you extrapolate that over the entire genome, there's a lot of variation in mutation rate. So that's my answer. If that, I don't know if that okay. helps, but we'll Do I get a chance um, to say something real fast? Yeah, of course. Well, of course. You, uh, I was just going to say that is actually not representing what I have in my book, but that's the same song, multiple verses now, it seems. I address all these things in the book extensively, and it's not accurate to describe what I've said that way. Anyway, that's all. OK, um, I want to uh, take a second to thank uh, both of you for um, coming on and doing this. Uh, we will be um, hopefully doing a, um, a part two. I'd love to get into some of the deeper aspects. Um, it, it didn't feel like two hours at all. I mean, that was just very quick. So um, once again, thank you both for uh, taking the time to do this. And um, Steve, do you have any closing thoughts? I don't, I, except for the fact, you know, I do really want to recognize the fact that Dr. Jeanson was re really very uh, nice to send us copies of the book. Again, it's not an easy person's read for the layperson. Um, I, I think that it's, it's well structured. I think that obviously the biology in it, from uh, my limited experience is quite good. Um, I, I think that I've seen some omission things as well that maybe another time we could probably discuss. Um, but uh, I do want to thank him for sending me that. And I do want to thank Dr. Mays for coming on multiple times um, as he has and just been gracious enough with his time to discuss these things because this is his actual field of expertise. So thank you very much, both of you. If I can okay. thank Dr. All Mays right, as well. Good. Sure. Sorry, yeah, absolutely. I was just going to say when we, when we uh, set up this debate and People asked for candidates. I had specifically asked for Dr. Mays because he was uh, so kind in his previous debates, and I, I really appreciate him taking the time uh, for the ways interacted. 
uh, it just it's it's a privilege to be opposite him. And so, thank you so much. Well, I I appreciate the opportunity, and and um, yeah, and I know it's a tough thing for you to go out and 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 do this, and I understand the position you're in. So I I do appreciate you taking the time to do this. In the lion's we, we den, he, he, he remained yeah. cool in the lion's den, didn't he? Uh, he did. I thought he did. He remained I, I very, he very did, cool. Yes. In the... Very cool, like a All right. cucumber. All right, guys, we'll see you uh, in about 15 minutes. Um, we're sending out links for that now, so you should get those. And um, we will uh, continue in about 15. So thank you for watching. Um, thank you to Answers in Genesis for uh, lending us uh, Dr. Jensen and, um, of course, Dr. Mays, you as well. Um, we will see you uh, here shortly. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night, guys. Non sequitur. Your facts are uncoordinated.